the title of our sermon this morning is Christ Our Priest, Christ Our Priest. And we are continuing our study of the essentials this morning, an introduction to those theological subjects that we believe to be essential to the growth and maturity of the Christian. And last week, we began considering the work of the Lord Jesus Christ as mediator between God and men, uh, wherein as our mediator, he fulfills three offices for the benefit of his church, namely the offices of prophet, priest, and king. Uh, last Lord's Day, we looked at the role of Jesus Christ in the office of prophet. This morning, it is our joy and privilege to consider uh, the office of Christ or the role of Christ, the function of Christ in his office as our great high priest. Now, I'm thinking about the Lord's function, the Lord's role as the one mediator between God and men, he first serves as prophet. The Lord is the supreme and preeminent agent of God's revelation to man. He stands as prophet facing the people, so to speak, and serves as a spokesman for God. The prophet delivers the very word of God to the people of God. Now, in his role as mediator, Jesus Christ, the anointed one, then serves as priest. Rather than facing the people, the priest is described as facing God or representing the people to God, petitioning God on behalf of his people. And remember, these offices, uh, the office of prophet, priest, and king, are anointed offices held by anointed men. And held by anointed men until the one came who fulfilled these offices in their fullness in his person and work, namely the Messiah, the Christ or the anointed one. Our confession of faith, the London Baptist Confession, in chapter 8, article 10, explains it this way. It says, This number and order of offices is necessary, for in respect of our ignorance we stand in need of his prophetical office, and in respect of our alienation from God and imperfection of the best of our services, we need his priestly office to reconcile us and present us acceptable to God. Now think with me for a moment about what our confession is saying there. You and I are born in sin. You and I are born in alienation from God. We are cut off, cast out. Even the best of our services to God are corrupted by sin, stained by sin, polluted by sin. The wages of our sin is death, and the soul that sins, it shall surely die. We think about that then. What is our greatest need? What's our greatest need? We need life, eternal life. We need reconciliation with God, a right relationship to the one who has created us in his image, and to live for his glory alone. We need forgiveness, forgiveness of sins. We need our guilt removed. We need righteousness in order to stand before him. Holiness without which no one will see the Lord. We need his wrath. The wrath that is justly directed against us. We need that wrath to be taken out of the way. To be propitiated. We need to be born again. We need to be made a new creation. Otherwise, without this work, you will perish eternally in hell for your sin. You have offended an eternal God. Now, what we need then, what we need is we need a mediator, a mediator to go before us, to represent us to God, to stand before him on our behalf because we cannot stand before him, right? Our God is a consuming fire. We need a mediator to represent us to God, one who would be worthy enough to enter the very presence of God on our behalf. One who could fulfill all the just and righteous requirements of God's holy law. One who could take our punishment. One who could deal with our guilt. One who could pay our debt. And, wonder of wonders, God himself in grace and mercy has appointed just such a mediator. That mediator is the one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. It is through his spirit, the spirit of Christ, that we are born again. It is through his mediatorial work alone that we have forgiveness of our sins. It's through his mediatorial work that we receive his righteousness as our own righteousness. It is through him 
that we are declared ourselves to be righteous in God's sight. It's through His once for all sacrificial death on our behalf that we are eternally saved. He was our substitute, stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. The Lord Jesus Christ is our great and faithful high priest. He gives us everything that we need. Amen? The work is done. We receive it through repentant faith, turning from our sin, turning from our rebellion against Him, and trusting in Him alone to save us. Now, we have been given the tremendous blessing, the tremendous privilege, the joy of seeing that truth in all of its technicolor splendor revealed to us on the pages of the New Testament. However, for those under the Old Covenant, for those that lived in Old Testament days, they could only foresee the Lord's priestly work through types and shadows, through types and shadows. It was more mysterious to them. And one of the first places that we most clearly encounter one of those types and shadows of the priestly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in fact, the first place that we encounter the word priest in Scripture involves a very enigmatic figure from the Old Testament, but one that proves to be extremely important in explaining the role of Christ as priest for us in the New Testament. Turn with me to Genesis 14. Genesis 14. And look there beginning with me at verse 13. Genesis chapter 14, beginning at verse 13. Now, at this point in the Genesis record, Abram and his nephew Lot have separated. Abram is living in Hebron, and Lot has pitched his tent toward Sodom. Chapter 13, verse 13 says, The men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Now, by the time we get to Genesis 14, Lot is actually living in Sodom now. <laughs> and he's caught up in a war now that erupts between four eastern kings and a confederacy of five kings of Canaan. They fight it out, these two sets of kings, they fight it out at the southern end of the Dead Sea in the Valley of Sidim. The five kings of Canaan are defeated, including the king of Sodom, and Lot now is taken captive with his family. We look now beginning at verse 13. Then the one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner, and they were allies with Abram. Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house, and he went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. And so he brought back all the goods. He also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. Now Abraham, in verse 13, verses 13 to 16, Abraham able to feel the militia of his own men, 318, born in his own house. That tells you how abundantly, abundantly God has blessed Abram. Now Abram takes those 318 born in his own house. They were trained, and he masterfully plans a sneak attack by night and he routs the armies of the four eastern kings in the middle of the night. And by doing so, he successfully rescues Lot, his family, brings back all of his possessions. Abram then is visited by two kings. Look at verse 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley, after his return from the de defeat of Keterlamer and the kings who were with him. In verse 18, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. Now, it's interesting in verse 18, these two kings, one of them the king of Sodom, second the king of Salem, named Melchizedek, okay? Melchizedek, the name is a compound word meaning king of righteousness, king of righteousness. And notice in verse 18, he's also the king of Salem. 
The word Salem means peace. He's the king of peace. But also, Salem refers to Jerusalem. If you look at Psalm 76, verse 2, Jerusalem is called Salem. And here we're introduced to Melchizedek, this enigmatic figure who is the king of Jerusalem, the king of peace, the king of righteousness. Now, it's interesting also, they meet in the King's Valley. King's Valley, just south of Jerusalem. It's in Jerusalem, the King's Valley. So this Melchizedek, uh, Israel at this time was a series of city-states. And these city-states had kings or rulers over them. There would have been many in this region. Uh, we see the four kings who were already in this region, or the five kings of Canaan. These were all city-states, and Melchizedek would have been a leader among those city-states. And he comes out to greet Abram after his victory in the Valley of the Kings. Now, Melchizedek is not only a king. Melchizedek is also a priest. Notice that from verse 18. He was priest of God Most High. It's the first place this word is used in the Bible, the word priest. And notice, not a pagan priest. He's in Canaan, but he's not a Canaanite priest. Even in the midst of this Canaanite region, he was a priest of God Most High, El Elyon. He's referring to the sovereign Lord. And recognizing here Abram as a servant of God Most High, acknowledging God Most High as the one who has given Abram the victory, and then Melchizedek brings out bread and wine. That's interesting, isn't it? He brings out bread and wine. That's a priestly service that Melchizedek is offering. It's a priestly service, a priestly function, and he brings out a blessing for Abram. Now notice with me also in verse 18, Melchizedek comes out of nowhere. We've not heard of Melchizedek before this point. He comes out of nowhere. There's no background provided. We don't know who his mother is. We don't know who his father is. We don't have a genealogy. There's no record of his birth. There's no record of his death. He's a mystery. It would appear as though in Scripture that he has no beginning and has no end. And it's painted that way on purpose. It's a literary device, if you will. Melchizedek is setting us up for something greater. There's a mystery here. Now, both Abraham and Melchizedek worship the same God. Abram uses the very same name for God in verse 22. He is the God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And he's the same one who promised blessings to Abram in Genesis chapter 12 already. And now what do we see Melchizedek doing? Melchizedek comes to Abram bringing a blessing. We see promise and fulfillment, don't we? Promise and near fulfillment. There will be a far greater, far fulfillment. Now look with me again at verse 19 now. So, Melchizedek blessed him, and he said to Abram, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abram, gave him a tithe of all. Now Melchizedek, king of righteousness, priest of God Most High, serves as a priestly mediator of God's blessings to Abram, right? Abram, in turn, recognizes Melchizedek as a legitimate priest of God Most High, and in doing so, he gives Melchizedek a tithe. It's, that becomes a pattern, if you will, a pattern that we'll see in the Levitical priesthood under the law. It's a pattern, that tithe that is given. It's a pattern under the Mosaic covenant, under the Mosaic law, and we'll see later, it's a pattern that has significant importance under the new covenant as well. So tithing, before the law, under the law, and after the law, in other words. Melchizedek gives, or Abram gives Melchizedek a tithe of all. Now consider all of this in contrast with the way that Abram interacts with the king of Sodom. Look at verse 21. That was Melchizedek, verse 21. Now the king of Sodom comes, and he says to Abram, Give me the persons, take the goods for yourself. Notice the king of Sodom comes empty-handed. <laughs> no greeting, no honor, no gratitude, no indication of joy. Abram won the battle, <laughs> defeated the enemy that just defeated the king of Sodom. No joy, no gladness at meeting Abram here conveyed. He lost the battle, and yet he is the one who's setting the terms here, isn't he? Give me the persons, take the goods for yourself. 
surely indicates how ungrateful and wicked this king really was. Verse 22, But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. Except only what the young men have eaten, the portion of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshkel, and Mamre, let them take their portion. So we see the king of Salem then in direct contrast with the king of Sodom. The king of righteousness in contrast with a known king of unrighteousness. Melchizedek offers bread, wine, and a blessing from God Most High. The king of Sodom offers the spoils of war with an intent to exploit that for his own advantage. Now, Abram, if you think with me, could have taken advantage of this, couldn't he? Abram won a victory. Abram could have taken land for himself in Canaan, having won this victory, but that would have been a shortcut. God has promised to give him the land. Abram could have thought, well, maybe this is the way that God's going to give it to me. I'm going to take it through this victory. But Abraham doesn't do that. He recognizes that it's a wicked shortcut. And rather than taking the shortcut, Abram chooses to cast his lot, so to speak, with God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth, who will give him the land in God's timing. Will give him the land in the way that God has determined to give it to him. So he doesn't take the shortcut. It's in the very next chapter, chapter 15, that God then explains to Abram that he will have a son. A son will be from his own body. And it will be his descendants who will inherit the land that God has promised him. Not now, but 400 years later. Verse 13, chapter 15, verse 13, they will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. Speaking of the land of Egypt. And after 400 years... They will come out with great possessions. And of course, because the sin of the Amorites was not yet complete. All of this, of course, is exactly what happens. Right? Exactly. The Lord delivers them out of bondage in Egypt. He directs them to Sinai. And there in the wilderness, before Mount Sinai, God enters into covenant with His people under Moses. He gives them the law. And then he establishes the Old Covenant Levitical priesthood. More types and shadows. The Old Covenant priest, and in particular the high priest, would be the quintessential type or shadow, you could say. It would be the significant type or shadow of the future substance that is the priestly work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me to the right, to Exodus chapter 28. Exodus chapter 28. Here in Exodus 28, you could also look at Leviticus chapter 8 and 9. The Lord is establishing the Aaronic priesthood or the Levitical priesthood. This would be a type of that great high priest that is to come. These are types and shadows. Look at Exodus 28, beginning at verse 1. The Lord says to Moses, Now take Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest, Aaron and Aaron's son, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as priest. These are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. And so they shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons, that he may minister to me as priest." Now, the purpose of Aaron here, the purpose of the priesthood, is for Aaron, or the priesthood, to represent the people to God. He is to carry the people, as it were, on his heart or in his bosom as he enters into communion with God. He's to represent them to God. Look at verse 9. Verse 9. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Now, why would he do that? Right? Six of their names on one stone, 
six names on the other stone in order of their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall set them in settings of gold. You notice how the Lord is also concerned with the beauty of his worship? Right? <laughs> That's a, a point that strikes me in reading these texts. There's there's great symbolism here. There's, there are types and shadows involved here. There's significance and importance to everything that goes on. And in addition to this, the Lord is concerned about the excellence of his worship, the beauty of his worship, right? The, uh, the holiness of his worship, certainly. But here, the, the beauty of it as well. Um, you shall set them in settings of gold. Verse 12, you shall put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. And so Aaron with those names written upon the stones, shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial. Drop down to verse 15. Verse 15. There you shall make the breastplate of judgment. Now, the breastplate of judgment, it's not judgment against Israel. It's called the breastplate of judgment because the Urim and the Thummim were also uh, inserted there into the breastplate. And that was a way that the people of Israel at that day could discern the will of God in doubtful cases, the Urim and the Thummim. And so it's called the breastplate of judgment, right? You shall make the breastplate of judgment artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod. You shall make it of gold, blue, purple, scarlet thread, fine woven linen. You shall make it. It shall be doubled into a square. A span shall be its length and a span shall be its width. You shall put settings of stones in it. Four rows of stones. The first row shall be a stardius, a topaz, and an emerald. This shall be the first row. The second row shall be a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. The fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold settings. And the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, each one with its own name, and they shall be according to the twelve tribes. Verse 29, So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. And you shall put the breastplate of judgment, the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. And so Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. Right? It's, um, Aaron is pictured, and it's intimate, isn't it? It's, it's precious. It's beautiful. He, he takes the sons of Israel uh, in his bosom so to speak, as he enters the most holy place to go before God. He carries them over his heart. Um, this is love. This is care. This is concern. Uh, this is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? The Lord Jesus Christ bears his people upon his heart as he enters behind the veil for us. It's our Lord that carries us in his bosom. Right? All of this is a picture a picture of what the Lord Jesus Christ would do in his high priestly office for us. Here, Aaron carrying the tribes of Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ carrying in his bosom all of those who are the seed of Abraham by faith in himself, right? All those who are the seed of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ. And he carries us on his heart behind the veil. He carries us in the very presence of the Lord God. He says in verse 31 then, 31, you shall make the, ro the robe of the ephod all of blue. There shall be an opening for his head in the middle of it. It shall be a woven binding all around its opening, like the opening of a coat of mail, so that it does not tear. And upon its hem, you shall make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet all around its hem, bells of gold between them all around, a gold bell and a pomegranate, a gold bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe all around, all around. And it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers, and its sound will be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out, that he may not die. You shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it, like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. All of this a picture also, is it not, that God is holy and we are not. God is holy. He is to be revered as holy. His name is to be hallowed as holy. As holy, God is to be holy in our sight. God is holy. 
Incidentally, it was said that the bells along the bottom of Aaron's ephod, the ephod of the high priest, were so that when Aaron entered the holiest of all, the most holy place, once per year on the Day of Atonement, to make atonement for the sins of the people, Aaron went in there alone. He first had to consecrate himself by sacrifice so that blood could cover his own sin, and then he took the blood of the sacrifice into the most holy place on behalf of the people. And he would pour the blood out upon the mercy seat where God is said to dwell between the cherubim. And the bells were there so that if God struck, Ab uh, struck the high priest dead inside the most holy place, the bells would stop ringing, and then they would, they would know to drag him out by his feet. The bells were there so the bells would jingle, and they would know that he was still alive. God is holy. God is holy. And this system is set up to depict God's holiness and our alienation from him in our sin. But it's all to point forward. It's to point to the necessary work that it would take for the Lord Jesus Christ to do to secure our own redemption, and it's to point forward to him in the completion of that work on our behalf. It's a glorious, glorious picture, a glorious illustration, a helpful illustration. We can only know and understand what Jesus Christ has done for us by knowing and understanding the Old Testament, right? We need this. A priest would make sacrifices of the Lord first for their own sins, and then he would make sacrifice for the sins of the people. Look at Exodus 29. Flip the page and look there beginning at verse 38. 29, 38. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. One lamb you shall offer in the morning. The other lamb you shall offer at twilight. With the one lamb shall be one-tenth of an ephah of flour mixed with one-fourth of a hen of pressed oil and one-fourth of a hen of wine as a drink offering. And the other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and you shall offer with it the grain offering and the drink offering as in the morning for a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. This shall be, verse 42, a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak with you. There I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. So I will consecrate the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister to me as priests. I will dwell among the children of Israel, and we will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them up from the land of Egypt, so that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God." In other words, the Levitical priesthood stood before the presence of God on behalf of the people. They themselves were sanctified, consecrated, or set apart by a blood sacrifice, and they would bear the blood of sacrifices continually before the Lord. There would be no end to this if this were all that there were. There'd be no end continuously throughout your generations. And all this to atone for the sins of the people so that they would not be destroyed by God who is a consuming fire. You see? The high priest would enter the inner sanctuary of the temple called the most holy place or the holy of holies. He would do so only once per year on the day of atonement pour out the blood of the sacrifice on the mercy seat for the sins of Israel. The people themselves could not approach, only the consecrated priest. The people themselves, there was a separation, right? Only the high priest and only once per year. And it was this service that enabled the people to worship the Lord and enjoy the blessings of his presence among them without dying. It was temporary just so they could worship the Lord without dying. Now, the descendants of Aaron would be the ones who served as priests. It's the Aaronic order. Now, the Lord would separate to himself the tribe of Levi from among the 12 tribes of Israel to serve as priests. That's why it's called the Levitical priesthood. And notice, the sacrifices must be made day by day continually. Animal sacrifices cannot atone for human sin. The people couldn't enter the Holy of Holies, just the high priest and only once per year. The people 
aren't consecrated to God in the same way that the priests are consecrated to God. They're not priests themselves. The people can't enjoy the fullness of God's presence. Neither can the high priest, for that matter. This doesn't get us back to a restored relationship, does it? It doesn't get us back there. It doesn't get us back to the place where the Lord walked in the garden in the cool of the day, where you could hear his voice. There's no eternal life under this system. All these priests, even though consecrated, all these priests die. And many priests have died. And many priests were continuously being raised up in their place when they died. A finite creature cannot atone for sins against the infinite God. In other words, this system does not save. You see, it's a, it's a stopgap measure. At best, a stopgap measure. It does not save. Enter then the Lord Jesus Christ. Enter the Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Turn with me to Hebrews. Or let me read this. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Only the blood of the very Son of God could fully and finally cleanse us from sin. Only His shed blood. Only He can bring us into the presence of God. And only in Him can we enter. Our God is a consuming fire. The shedding of the blood of the only begotten Son of God at Calvary's cross has opened up a new way for us and opened up a new and living way by, by which we may draw near to Him. But we have a problem. We have a problem. The Levitical priesthood has been done away with. That old covenant is obsolete. It's vanished away. It's disappeared. It's gone. It's been rendered obsolete with the coming of the new covenant. And how can the Lord's priesthood be a legitimate priesthood if the Lord isn't from the tribe of Levi? The Lord is from the tribe of Judah. He's the lion from the tribe of Judah. We know that. So does that mean then that the Lord is unqualified to serve as high priest? No. <laughs> no. Jesus Christ receives his priesthood from another source, a far superior source. Every other priest finds sanction for his work under the law, according to the Levitical mandate, but not Jesus Christ. Turn to Psalm 110. Psalm 110, in one of the most frequently quoted passages in all the New Testament from the Old Testament. Psalm 110, I think... Um, Leviticus 19, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, is the only Old Testament passage quoted more. We have one of the most frequently quoted passages, Psalm 110. And look there beginning at verse 1. This is a messianic psalm, messianic psalm, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. You can see how it's uh, not only a priestly psalm, but a kingly psalm as well. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn, he has taken an oath, he will not relent you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He receives his priesthood from a far superior source, the priesthood of Melchizedek. Not temporary, like the Levitical priests, but you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The, the Levitical priesthood was temporary. Being raised from the dead, it's Resurrection Day, Resurrection Sunday, being raised from the dead means that the Lord will never set aside his priestly office. He will be a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Coming to God through him, then, means for us eternal life. It means eternal life. Preserved not by our own power, but by his power, which is bounded, grounded on an indestructible life. The power of an endless 
life. He has an unchangeable priesthood, a priesthood that continues forever. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. It's a wondrous truth. The Bible is essentially silent on this connection, this connection between the Lord Jesus Christ and Melchizedek until you come to the book of Hebrews. And then Hebrews just abounds with references to Melchizedek and this very issue. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And look at verse 1. Now with the point of showing that Jesus Christ is our legitimate and faithful and great high priest, our author makes two basic points from the text beginning in chapter 7. One, the priestly order of Melchizedek is far superior to the priestly order of Aaron or the priestly order of the Levites. That's verses 1 through 10. Secondly, Jesus Christ is rightly our high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. His priestly office is legitimate. It is highly superior and Christ is rightly our high priest. Look at verse 1. For this Melchizedek, the king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, that's important, remains a priest continuously. Now remember, in verses 1 through 10, the priestly order of Melchizedek is superior to the order of Aaron or the Levitical priesthood. It's superior. Why is it superior? Because he remains a priest continuously. Do you see? Continually. He was made, look at verse 3, he was made like the Son of God. In other words, Melchizedek was raised up in Scripture as a type of Christ. It's not that Jesus Christ, we can't think this way, it's not that Jesus Christ was a copy of Melchizedek or that we're to think of Jesus Christ as another Melchizedek. No, no. Melchizedek is in Scripture by God's intention to point to Jesus Christ. That's his function in Genesis 14 and in Psalm 110, right? He is a type. Melchizedek is the copy pointing to the substance, pointing to the reality, who is Christ. Now notice the way in which he's brought up in Scripture. Verse 3, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. That's how our author here interprets Genesis 14. What Melchizedek portrays in a literary sense in Genesis 14, Christ fulfills in a literal sense. He remains priest continually. Do you see? The order of Melchizedek is superior to the order of Levites for the very reason that it is eternal, that it continues, remains continually. Now let's keep going. Verse 4. Now consider how great this man was, to whom, and we're speaking of Melchizedek, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are the, of the sons of Levi, who receive a priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. Verse 6. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them, that's Melchizedek, received tithes from Abraham and blessed Abraham who had the promises. In other words, Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. Now think with me about what the passage is saying. Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek. The Levitical, the, and he gave tithes to Melchizedek as a priest of the Most High God. The Levitical priesthood, the Levitical priesthood was commanded by God to receive tithes from the people. What do the people do? They all tithe to the Levitical priests. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them, Melchizedek, received tithes from Abraham, and Melchizedek blessed. Abraham, who had been given the promises by God. Therefore, Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. That's the point that's going to be made. Verse 7, beyond all contradiction, 
The lesser, Abraham, is blessed by the better, Melchizedek. Here, mortal men receive tithes. The Levitical priests receive tithes. But there, Melchizedek receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. That's the interpretation of Genesis 14. Melchizedek, without beginning, without end, literarily in Genesis 14, lives. He has a priesthood that remains continuously. All of that pointing forward to Jesus Christ. This is pointing to Jesus Christ. Even Levi, verse 9, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham to Melchizedek, so to speak. Verse 10, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So what the author here is setting up is that even the Levites who received tithes, those people who paid tithes, they paid tithes to the Levites who were in the loins, so to speak, of Abraham when Abraham from there paid tithes to the greater who is Melchizedek. See the argument that he's making? The Melchizedek order is far superior to the order of Aaron. Far superior to that of the Levites. Far superior. Therefore, verse 11, therefore, therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, which it couldn't be, the Levitical priesthood couldn't make anyone perfect. That was the problem with the Old Covenant. It couldn't make us perfect. But if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? It was necessary that one should arise according to the order of Melchizedek, and not according to the order of Aaron. It's, it's necessary to our salvation. That priesthood could not take away sins. 4, verse 12, The priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. It's evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So much to be said there. We just don't have the time to get into it yet. Verse 18, for on the one hand there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Our hope is based upon the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. He is a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, on the basis of an endless life, an indestructible life. Do you see? His priesthood superior because it is founded on the power of an endless life. Verse 20, And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath, by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more Jesus has become the surety or the guarantor of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests. Why were there many priests? Because they kept dying. <laughs> because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, verse 24, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save. Because his priesthood lasts forever and is unchangeable, he is able to save to the uttermost. He is able to give us eternal life. He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him, since He always and forever lives to make intercession for them. Verse 26, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, then for the sins of the people, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Hear me, Catholics. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, 
But the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. Melchizedek is superior to the Levites. And Jesus Christ is our high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And his priesthood is superior to any other priesthood because he is our high priest forever. Otherwise, salvation is impossible. The sacrifices of the old were insufficient. The old covenant itself, insufficient to save. That old covenant priesthood, unsustainable, untenable. How can you be cleansed by animal sacrifices? You cannot. How can God's wrath be propitiated? It cannot. These are shadows and shadows only. Christ's sacrifice is alone the sacrifice that truly saves. The work of our Lord's priestly ministry includes, one, the sacrifice of Himself, and two, the ongoing, continual intercession for His people. Christ's sacrifice of Himself at Calvary and His ongoing session in heaven for His people. These are effective for salvation when the work of the Old Testament priest was not the effectiveness of Christ's priestly work. That effectiveness is tied to its superiority. It's the basis for which his priestly work and priestly office is superior to that of the Old Covenant. And this was superior. It was due to Jesus being a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Flip the page and look at Hebrews chapter 8 and look at verse 1. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. What is the true? That which is in heaven. What is the copy? That which we see in the Old Testament. Right? Verse 3, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. The pattern of that which was in the heavenlies was shown to Moses on the mountain. Moses was to make the tabernacle according to that pattern. But now, verse 6, he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. You know, we might be tempted to think of the old covenant rituals, the old covenant ceremonies, the sacrifices as being the model or as being the standard that Jesus then copies and fulfills. That's not the case at all. All that that we see in the Old Testament, all of that, the temple, the priests, the garments, right? The ceremony, the ritual, the blood sacrifices, the holy of holies, the mercy seat, all of that is the copy. All of that is mere shadow of the real substance. And all of that informs our understanding of the real, right? All of that is a lived out parable. It's a living illustration, if you will, a copy of what Christ himself would fully and finally do on the great day of atonement, where he would go to the cross for his people, shedding of his own place, when he would then enter the holy place once for all. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. Flip the page, Hebrews chapter 9, look at verse 11. These texts almost explain themselves when we think about them in this light, don't they? But Christ came, verse 11, as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of his creation, not with the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more, verse 14, shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, He is the mediator and our high priest of the new covenant. By means of death, 
the sacrifice of himself for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal the eternal inheritance otherwise salvation is impossible how should we respond what shall we say then to these marvelous and wondrous realities right what Jesus Christ has done for us what he has suffered on our behalf the magnitude and excellency of his person and his work right how are we the people of God born again by his spirit and dwelt by his spirit serving him desiring to be faithful how should the people of God then respond Hebrews chapter 10 look at verse 19 therefore brethren having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil that is His flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, brothers and sisters, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Do not draw back. Do not waver. Do not let your heart be troubled, right? Serve Christ. Follow Christ. Look to Christ. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Let me ask you, should we go about that glorious work half-hearted? <laughs> Never. We have a great high priest seated in the heavenlies who's gone before us. Let us have boldness then, brothers and sisters. Let us stir up one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together even during this time, right? As is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. Draw near to God in full assurance of faith. Hold fast your confession without wavering. Stir one another up to love and good works, exhorting one another. We should do that with all earnestness and with all fervency, with all love and devotion and gratitude in our hearts. Not like the, the ungrateful king of Sodom, right? Hebrews 10, look at verse 35. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Don't turn back. You have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while. Just a little while. I love those words, right? Yet just a little while. And he who is coming will come and will not tarry. The just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Hold fast your confession. Do not draw back. He who endures to the end will be saved. Right? Hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, fix your eyes on him who is the author and finisher of our faith. He is our great high priest. When you're weary or discouraged, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Strengthen the hands which hang down. Strengthen the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet. Pursue peace and holiness. Chapter 12, verse 28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 10, speaking of his priesthood. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus Christ also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, verse 13, let us, brothers and sisters, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. We have no continuing city here. We seek the city that is to come, the city whose builder and maker is God. Right? Therefore, by him, let us continually offer sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. 
Do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. What a great salvation, right? Absolutely stunning, staggering, amazing, astonishing, beautiful, majestic, glorious, wondrous, awe-inspiring, worship-provoking, right? What an amazing, amazing salvation we've been given. All praise, honor, and glory to Christ, our great high priest, who always lives to make intercession for us. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you. We worship you. Lord, we thank you for sending your only begotten Son into the world to save wretched and deplorable and despicable sinners like ourselves. We praise you for the efficacy and the majesty and the splendor of his high priestly work on behalf of his bride, his elect, those whom he would come to save. We praise you, Lord, for your grace and mercy that is magnified in this wondrous work and poured out on us uh, through him by your spirit. And I pray, Lord, that there wouldn't be a single person listening now who would treat that as a common thing, that would trample the blood of the covenant underfoot, insulting the spirit of grace. I pray that everyone, Lord, would turn to the Son, turn from their sin, trust in His perfect and complete and finished work, and be saved. They would worship and praise the Lamb who was slain forever and ever. And we thank you, Lord, for this word, uh, your word to your people, Lord, how it builds us up in our faith, how it bolsters our hope, how it provokes awe and wonder and worship and praise. And I pray, Lord, that we would meditate on these things and that we would respond as we should, that we would enter with boldness, having our hearts sprinkled, our consciences cleansed um, through his blood, that we would stir one another up to love and good works, exhorting one another daily even more while it's called today, that we would, Lord, that we would with Christ bear his reproach, going outside the camp, considering the reproach of Christ to be greater treasure than all the riches of Egypt. And I pray, Lord, that we would honor you in our devotion to you, honor you in our praise to you, that we would consider these things as we pray and consider these things as we sing and consider these things as we read our Bibles and consider these things as we live day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. You are worthy of the whole of our lives and we praise you and look forward, Lord, to you coming back. We know that you will not tarry. And we know that you will come. And we look forward with great anticipation to that day and our eternal rest with you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.